Well, we're going to do something really fun, or at least I hope you think so. We're going to take a look at AJ. You can see him down there below, reported by AJ, and you can find him on X at A-L-O-J-O-H. <clears throat> and if you decide later that you want to go check it out on, on his uh, uh, X account, you can go through these uh, one by one. Now, right now, it's only in his subscription uh, category, so you'd have to subscribe in order to see them. Uh, but eventually, I assume he'll make it uh, public for everybody. Anyway, we're going to take a look at his entire plan here, where he says the EPS for the third quarter will be 57 cents per share. And that is a 9.8% sequential increase over the previous month. So let's go from there. Okay, he starts with wait a minute, financial summary. So the very beginning here, you can see that he has deliveries coming in at 488,350. Now that's a very strong delivery number. He's one of the highest out there and he might be off by a substantial amount on that, but that's where he's he comes in. And we'll see the breakdown on some of these other items later. Uh, but you can see where the automotive revenue comes in. You can see where energy and storage, he's got that going up. Uh, actually coming down a little bit from last time where it was at 3,000. And 14, I mean, sorry, $3 billion. Uh, he's got that coming down to $2.4 billion. You've got service and others uh, continuing up slightly. Um, and then he mentions that uh, he gives a whole list here that the total revenue, mostly driven by automotive and energy, we know this. We know that the operating expenses are, de are declining, driven by a headcount adjustment. That would be the primary reason. We know that free cash flow. Uh, will be also decreasing probably because of the high capex. Um, he mentions that the gross profit will be declining slightly because uh, auto uh, average selling price. He's got the selling price coming down. We'll show that in a couple of minutes. Um, and free cash flow, however, driven uh, up. I'm sorry, decreasing slightly uh, because of uh, no significant inventory unwind. So those are kind of the highlights here. If you want to take a snapshot, you know, a screenshot, don't hesitate to do that. And uh, but as noted before, you know, he comes in with this uh, uh, overall uh, gross margin here of 15.7 percent, uh, which is automotive at 15.8 energy and storage at 25%, services another at 6.4%. So there you go. Next he has is the vehicle deliveries, as mentioned, reaching an all-time high, 488,000, uh, compared to last December at 485,000. I, again, I think this, this is one of the highest numbers on the street. Is it possible? Absolutely, it's possible. It would be a nice increase over the last third quarter, Last year's third quarter at 435, or last quarter at 444. Nothing like the increases we're hoping to see maybe next year, where we might be looking at 50% uh, month over month beats all year long, or close to it. He's got his average selling price coming down pretty substantially here, uh, from 42.6 to 42.2. Uh, but, you know, even a year, a couple of years ago, we were at 52. Now, that has a lot to do with the fact that the prices of the cars have just come down. Um, you know, as the inflation has gone up, the price of the cars has come down. But of course, this has all to do with that boom bust situation that we went through during COVID. And uh, the, I, this selling price, you know, number might go up a little bit in the fourth quarter, might go up a little bit in the first quarter as we get more and more cyber trucks into the mix. Uh, even though the cyber trucks, cyber truck prices will be coming down, but you've got more of them. And, and since they're much higher than the average price, of the Model Ys and Model 3s, I wouldn't be surprised to see a little uptick in this uh, in future months, but maybe not enough uh, sales right now to for AJ at least to see that it would uptick so far. Next, we have the automotive revenue returns returning to year-over-year -year growth. Again, that's driven by the fact that you have his high number there. So overall revenue going to $20.2 billion. Um, overall automotive revenue going to 20.2 20, 20, uh, billion. That's slightly down from the all-time high of 20.6 or this other uh, uh, quarter of uh, uh, the June quarter of last year. Um, so slightly down because again of the average selling cost being down, but still a very solid number at uh, 
20.2 per quarter would give you a run rate of over 80 billion per year just in automotive revenue. Next, he has the Cybertruck's growing contribution with a high ASP. So that is reducing the, the uh, financing rates impact. So one of the things that's impacting the cost, the average selling cost right now is that we're giving these good deals on financing and that comes right off of the, off of the ASP. Uh, it doesn't come out of the margin, rather it comes out of the, uh, of the average selling price. So it's right off the top line. If it costs $2,000 uh, to reduce the, uh, the, uh, uh, the interest rate are um, $3,000. That comes off of the average selling price. So anyway, he's showing here where he, we have these high dollar Cybertruck item numbers coming in, but as being offset pretty dramatically by the average selling price of the Ys and the threes. Next, you have automotive revenue on a year-on-year -year increase that's driven by the uh, volume with a partial offset by pricing. So this is him giving you that detail that we talked about just a few minutes ago. Um, then we have the credits. Okay, he looks at credit revenue. He's put out a couple of, of reports on this, and he believes that the credit revenue will continue to be very strong as we see General Motors and, and Volkswagen, I mean, you right down the line, you see these companies that are backing away from the BEV business. And as such, they're making more ICE cars that are not qualified for these credits. Um, and as a result, they've got to pay somebody uh, to purchase these credits and, and Tesla's getting a lot of them. So he's looking at the real possibility here, uh, he, it, showing here where he thinks there's a quarter by quarter, why, why he thinks there's ups and downs, but a $700 million uh, uh, credits, you know, just pure profit is not bad. And that's what he's expecting for the third quarter. Next, he goes into the e OEMs are dialing back their EV production. He's, this is where he gives the detail on this. And that's where those high credit revenues come from. And if you have interest in looking at this in detail and looking at some of his uh, comments with regard to it. You could certainly take a snapshot of this page, but that's how he comes to his $700 million number. Next, you have Tesla's credit sales expected to approach $2.5 billion this year. Um, that's a huge amount. You could buy it, you could build an entire factory for $2.5 billion. Um, so that's a, that's a really great number. And again, you can see how it's increasing um, over the years. It's been just continuing up uh, and now he thinks maybe this year will be 2.5 billion. Now then you've got the leasing. So you got leasing, uh, the, the cars come in as uh, the, uh, as the, there's a runoff, uh, as the leasing, um, uh, as you see the cars coming in back from, from being on lease. He thinks that uh, Tesla has been de-emphasizing leasing sales. Um, and so a lower leasing share is economically favorable Lower leasing share reduces the lease asset revaluation risk. Although, you know, in the past, the the, the asset had grown because the prices were going up. And he says, but this is driving the attrition of Tesla's leasing book and results in lower automotive leasing revenue. So Tesla's targeted leasing offers across various markets year to date moderately slowed the, the actual reduction in leasing revenue, but it is still reducing, still going lower in his opinion. So he's showing that their vehicle leasing share is expected to remain at an all-time low um, uh, as a percentage of overall sales. And then uh, total automotive revenue, um, he thinks will return to a year-on-year -year growth driven by strong volume growth. Uh, this, again, is just another version of what we've already seen once before. Energy. Here we go to energy storage. All right. Energy storage deployments expected to temporarily moderate in line with the historic quarter over quarter deployment volatility. So once again, we've talked about this where there's bookkeeping issues with regard to when you get to when you get to actually uh, uh, count your your, so you have the revenue coming in and or you might have con contractual understandings where you're able to invoice the item, but you're not yet able to take it as a profit on the uh, P&L because you haven't 
you're not able to recognize it as I guess the, the proper term, you're not able to recognize it because of your contractual arrangement with the client. Um, and so uh, you're gonna see this choppiness. We've seen the choppiness. You can see choppiness all along here, up and down, up and down. So it's not a matter of how many are getting shipped or how many are getting build, built, but it's rather how many are getting billed, are able to be billed for the purposes of the PL. Then you have energy storage prices are expected to remain unchanged. There's been about a, he's estimating a 16% implied drop in the second quarter. Uh, they're, they're only, they started out charging almost $2 million a piece for these units. Some folks are saying it might be down to an average of around a million now. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact they're being sold in such large quantities. So if somebody buys 120 of these, they're going to get a better deal if you buy than if you buy one. Um, and so some of it has to do with the large uh, packages that they're selling, but also part of it has to do with lithium prices have dropped dramatically. And as a result, you, the, these uh, institutional buyers that are buying these kind of quantities, they're going to put the pressure on Tesla to lower their cost because they know their selling price because they know that their costs have gone dramatically. So we've seen this. We've seen this take place. Uh, on the one hand, I've got constantly suggested, well, gee whiz, you'd think uh, if there's an unlimited TAM, you should be able to charge what you want. But apparently, you know, I've also been in the seller's shoes and the buyer's shoe uh, to know that uh, that uh, that conversation gets really tough if the buyer is looking over your shoulder and, and saying, look at what's happened to lithium prices. So anyway, he says uh, energy generation and storage revenue is up 50 percent year over year, driven by significant energy storage deployments. Uh, and so, we, again, just showing with the kind of growth that's taking place, even though this quarter, he believes, may not show all of it. Now, I think he's probably, this is, might be one of his bigger guesses, uh, because we really don't have any clear-cut data that we can go to in the 10 Qs or anything else where we can look and say, okay, this is what he's, they're going to be able to uh, actually uh, post uh, in the third quarter. But here's his guess for this quarter. Um, service and other long-term revenue is expected to increase along the lines of what has, has been all along. Now, this at some point, we might start to see a fairly substantial increase in service revenues um, as we have all of these um, uh, uh, stations, all of these uh, charging stations open. We have, we're beginning to have other brands coming in and using the charging stations. Um, so there's a, a revenues from services and other lots of other areas, uh, whether that's their electrical services that they have now, where they're acting actually as a retailer or sometimes as a wholesaler. So there's a bunch of this that might, at some point, we might begin to see this move up more strongly. But for now, he's betting that for this month, it'll be about 2.777 billion for the quarter. Um, he says total revenue then, as a result of all the things that we've just looked at, uh, will hit an all-time high. And, uh, you know, uh, Elon is saying that he thinks we'll pass $100 billion in 2024. I think that's probably likely. Uh, very, very close last year. And so very, I think we're pretty likely to go over $100 billion this year. But you can see the run rate, he's rec the run rate in the second quarter was at 25, was, you know, over $100 billion at 25.5. He's suggesting the totals will be 26.5 this quarter. And so you'd only need uh, a, a, a similar, maybe slightly bigger number, 28, 29, uh, to go over the 100 billion level. Uh, he says, that, well, Tesla will benefit now from a, sh uh, a, a from form a slight positive currency trend. He thinks there's a, this is really hard. You know, you've got, it's, we don't really know where Tesla is buying in dollars and where they're selling in dollars, where they're buying in one, where they're selling in one. And that goes around the world where you don't know how much Tesla is buying or selling in, in U.S. dollars to keep things consistent or where they're buying and buying or selling in the local currency. And this could come all the way, not just with regard to the finished units, like a uh, finished product that could have to do with parts, accessories, you could do with raw materials. And in many cases, you might be dealing in a foreign uh, currency. To the extent that you do that, you may have a hit to your to your uh, bottom line uh, because of currency uh, fluctuations. He's saying right now he thinks it might be positive for this quarter. 
Um, total gross profit down primarily because of the lower ASP. Now, you could look at this two different ways. You look at this um, low, the uh, reduction in interest rates that they're offering in order to get people to buy the cars. You can say, well, really, isn't that cost of goods? Well, you say, no, that's really advertising. It should be off the out of the the uh, entire cost of goods structure, you know, uh, the ASP minus the cost of goods gives you your gross profit. Well, shouldn't that be separate and be in an overhead? Well, you know, you could do it a bunch of different ways, actually. They're choosing to do it as take as reducing it right off the, the, the cost of the car, which is a fine way to do it and makes total sense. But anyway, so he's predicting that the gross profit will be down from 4.57 last quarter to 4.1. And you can see it topped out here at 5.77. So pretty, pretty far off of that number uh, for the fourth quarter of this year as margins. If you want, however you want to look at it, the margins are down and the margins are down now for a lower ASP. So you get a double hit. All right. He says both auto and ENS will contribute to the gross profit uh, decrease. So the gross profit, he thinks, comes in at about $4.2 billion. Um, and let me just do a little reading here. He says, the primary drivers of a reduction in auto ASP and expected quarter-over-quarter -quarter volatility in storage deployments will result in auto gross profit reduction from lower ASP, ASP and uh, energy uh, gross profit reduction by just fewer deployments that can be recorded. So when you get those two together, you get this drop from about four, the, you know, from 4.6 to about 4.2 billion in the quarter over quarter numbers. It says average vehicle gross profit is expected to reduce driven by this lower ASP and the lower credit sales. Um, so overall, he's looking for the vehicle gross profit to drop from as high at one point at 17.9. We got down to around 10, which most people, I think, use as kind of a as an easy way to figure it out. Um, commonly, I've done that, just figure 10,000 per car. He's saying, no, we're going to be down all the way to about $7 million. I'm sorry, $7,000 per car, 6.93,000 per car as an estimate uh, for the third quarter. Tesla's uh, TVs reach an all, a new all-time high of 576,000 vehicles. He says, this is a, whoops, I'm sorry. I have to move myself here a little bit so I can see. Uh, total implied vehicle sales. This is an alternative performance metric, which aims to capture both Tesla's automotive and energy segments in one metrics. TV, TVS represents the sum of Tesla's vehicle deliveries and implied vehicle equivalent from the energy segment. So you're taking the energy segment, pretending like it's a vehicle and coming up with a gross total if it was all vehicles. It's an interesting thing to do. Um, and so you've got, uh, of course, energy uh, going up nicely, auto going up okay, and the grand total going up very substantially um, okay. So then sequential average vehicle production cost increase is driven by a higher share of Cybertruck sales. So looking at one of the reasons why he's showing the profit down a bit is because you've got more and more cyber trucks coming in that may be reducing the still still at this point in the third quarter, reducing the profit per vehicle. Um, at some point that is going to switch out. I don't know what the number is per month or per week or whatever that you need to do before they start being a contributor at a higher level to profit than the other vehicles. But right now, at least, uh, he's believing that it's going to be a drag on profit margins. Model 3 and Y production cost decreases to an all-time low. He believes that the average of all vehicles across those two categories will be about $34,000 per vehicle, down from a couple of years ago in the fourth quarter at 38.6, just steadily dropping, dropping, dropping. Now, part of that was because of raw material uh, and other issues uh, during the pandemic and, and, and shortly thereafter. So we've seen lots of costs coming down, in particular battery costs coming down. But some of this is due to the continued uh, performance of the team in terms of driving the cost of manufacturing down 
um, and uh, keeping uh, overhead costs low in terms of labor, as we know, uh, which was part of the effort earlier this year. Um, he believes that the S and X, which are not a very big part of the business anymore, he thinks there'll be a cost reduction there, primarily driven by lower battery and raw material costs. These are more mature products, so it's harder to keep getting another nickel and another dime out of manufacturing costs. But I'm not thinking, I'm not suggesting that there would be none, although there's the other side of that, which is they're not making as many, which might actually be increasing some of the manufacturing costs a bit, and maybe even some of the uh, costs of, of parts. He says Cybertruck production costs are estimated at $91,000. That's derived, uh, derived from the uh, chief financial officers, officers' commentaries in the first and second quarter. So he's his best guess. They cost they cost ninety one thousand dollars each. They're selling them for around one hundred to one hundred twenty thousand, uh, depending on uh, the model and the design and the layout. So you can see that that's uh, you know, on the order of about a twelve or you know ten or twelve percent profit, and that's why it would be subtracting from the overall margins. Automotive margin decreases are driven again by that all uh, that uh, the the average selling price being down, and that dilutive effect of Cybertruck. As there's more of them with these lower margins, that's the overall effect he was talking about earlier. He says in the third quarter, the total um, all, uh, uh, average selling price reduction and Cybertruck will drive overall automotive reduction. So automotive margins. He says this is likely to be the the not the bottom this quarter, but in quarter four, he thinks that this will be the very bottom and that from quarter four on, from the first quarter of 2025, we will begin to see the auto margins begin to increase. And that'll be partially because we'll see an increase from the Cybertruck now profitable and probably more profitable than the three or the Y at some point early next year, I'm guessing is his theory here. Then automotive margins, uh, including leasing and credits will decrease. Uh, as mentioned, he, he's thinking it'll be, may be as low as 15.8. Last quarter, the all in, they were 18.5. Uh, 15.8, that would be a pretty big drop. So his high number in terms of total gross uh, unit sales uh, is offset by this lower margin is where he comes in with his final number for the quarter. Um, this this number might surprise him a little bit on the upside. Not sure that the cyber trucks will eat that much margin and or that the ASPs will eat that much margin. Energy storage margin improving, driven by unchanged pricing and further battery cost reductions. So he's believing that that will... He says it's improving. It's improving by four tenths of a of a point, uh, but it's been twenty five for a while, roughly twenty five for a while now. Um, some people think it'll go above twenty five. I would be in that category, but I certainly don't have any knowledge to. I don't have any specific information to back up my theory. Okay, then we have total gross margin decreasing, driven by lower ASP and the and uh, and also credits revenues. As we know, the credit revenues were very high last quarter. So he's saying the credit revenues will still be very high, but they'll be down compared to last quarter. So overall, he's thinking that the total gross margin will be about 15.7% as compared to last uh, quarter where it was 18%. Then we go to the research and development expenses. He expects those to increase, but those will be remain below peak levels during the various pro the recent product launches. Those might go up again in the new year as we have more product launches, but for now, he's thinking they'll be up a bit um, and uh, that this will be also a little bit of a drag on the final profit number. SGNA, he expect this, those to only ex expect, oh, he's only expecting SGNA to increase slightly because of the headcount reduction, uh, but he also has some wage hikes in this. So overall, he's thinking that that'll just barely go up by, uh, looks like uh, 10 million uh, from 1.277 million to 1.287 million um, after dropping nicely in the second quarter because of the head, head count. I, I'm thinking he might be a little high here. 
this might actually be better than he's thinking might see a uh, uh oh, and he says oh this is before restructuring charges so this is a gross number before restructuring tesla's major second quarter headcount adjustment restored tesla's historic efficiency so looking at uh 4.9 percent uh uh, of, of the of the SN, SGNA ratio uh, compared to re, uh, overall sales, so uh, yeah, and again, I think this might even be better than he's uh, than he's giving it. An absence of significant restructuring char charges will drive a significant quarter over quarter over qu quarter decrease in operating expenses. So the combination of the drop in overhead and then you add to that this the, there will no longer be the restructuring charge. So this will bring us back down to a lower number. Uh, well, uh, so a little higher than December, but uh, even lower than last year's uh, uh, third quarter. Uh, fourth quarter was a little lower, but um, anyway, so uh, good number. But again, based on the analysis that I just did for you on the other two slides, we might actually come in a little better than this. He might be just a little high on this one. Operating margin increased increases primarily driven by the absence of those major restructuring charges. Um, so the, the operating margin popping up to 6.7%, uh, which you can see would be in line with what it's been for the last five quarters, last four quarters, if that comes out to be true, but not nearly as good as, as it had been during the COVID boom year, uh, boom years, the, the, the especially uh, 2022 is a huge boom year. Uh, you know, where we're looking at 19.2% margin, 17 point. Those are crazy margins. And we might go back there, certainly with RoboTaxis and Optimus, uh, but even maybe with, uh, you know, with just having a better, a better market out there, a better market for cars in general uh, could drive these margins back up later. Operating margin, excluding restructuring charges, decreased quarter over quarter, driven by lower energy storage sales, ASP and credit sales. We've just been through all that. So he thinks the overall operating margin will drop to 6.7 from last quarter's 8.7, but that's still hard, uh, above the first quarter and uh, just barely below last year's third and fourth quarter are, uh, and, you know, just uh, yeah, so it's significantly below last quarter. But again, I'm thinking, um, yeah, this might be right, but it might be right. I think maybe there won't be as many car sales and there will be a little better overall uh, gross margin. So interest, he says, is becoming a very significant issue. Uh, the interest, of course, is being driven by higher balances of their interest bear bearing accounts over 30 billion. Uh, he's got it at 31, I think, billion at 4.6% because interest rates, of course, have come down just a little bit. So he had that at five a couple of quarters ago, but down, down to 4.6. Um, and that interest rate will probably be dropping unless they bought some really long-term bonds. We'll see what happens over the next uh, few quarters, but not a bad deal. 359 million in interest rate, income, interest income. That's a good thing. And then other income, he's estimating that at a $58 million level, have no, well, he might say what that's made up. He says net other income um, consists primarily of foreign exchange gains, which he mentioned, and some losses related to foreign currency denominated monetary assets and liabilities. So you got some assets and liabilities. So yeah, that's another thing you got. So you might have, get a gain uh, from uh, your uh, from the, the transactions that you're making in a country as a result of currency uh, changes, but all of a sudden you've got inventory sitting on the books, which might go the opposite way. So you, uh, the, it, whether it's inventory or it could be uh, your your um, uh, your <laughs> your your buildings, equipment, etc. The company says records gross realized gains, losses, and credit losses as a component of this number. And uh, so uh, in the third quarter, he's estimating, again, 58 million here from other income of all kinds. Forecast here now assumes no additional restructuring charges in the third quarter in line with the management guidelines. So the restructuring was at 622 and they're figuring, he's figuring this quarter will be zero. He says the effective tax rate assumed to remain unchanged at 20.8%. Uh, this is a number which is very hard to analyze, uh, but 
uh, as good a guess as any would be to say it'd be about the same with about everything with everything being about the same across the board in terms of their numbers not significant uh, moves he says the net income will increase primarily driven by the absence of restructuring charges that's the number one thing impacting this increase from 1.478 billion to 1.61 billion then that will give you an EPS increase of 9.8%, as you mentioned in the very first slide, to 57 cents per share expected. That gives you a run rate of about uh, $2.28. Yes, $2.28 yes, $2 per year. If that was to continue, you can see this has been increasing from a low of 45 to 52 last quarter, now 57. And with a big fourth quarter, we could certainly expect this uh, to be even higher in the fourth quarter. Then you've got third quarter's operating cash flow, quarter over quarter, slight reduction driven by the absence of the second quarter's unwind. So in the second quarter, you may, well, in the first quarter, you may, re you may remember there was this massive increase, like 30 million cars uh, 30, 30, was three, 30, 30 million seems way too high. What am I talking about? 30,000 cars. <laughs> An additional 30,000 cars uh, that were on ships and that were you know not delivered. Okay, let's just call it that. Then we saw that unwind in the second quarter. Which, so we had the decrease in cash flow down to only 242 million uh, in the first quarter. Then we had the increase by 3.6 billion in, uh, in the... Uh, June quarter, he's thinking now that that will be still a, a good cash flow increase of 2.944 billion. That's that's solid, but not as big as the last quarter because you don't have that big thing. He thinks um, that this will be uh, driven. Uh, well, he doesn't tell why he thinks there'll be this good of cash flow. I guess this will be like an average cash flow based on this profit. Uh, if you look back that would be, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that, yeah, I'm sure he's got more into it than that, but he doesn't tell us exactly how he got there. He says there'll be a moderate incremental third quarter net inventory sell-off. So there'll be some sell-off, he thinks, uh, of inventory uh, compared to the second quarter. He says the balance sheet inventory is expected to moderately reduce. So again, you can see if you if you're interested in this, uh, almost exactly the same inventory expected. Significantly higher number of mega packs in transit will prevent further inventory reduction. So because we, we're showing such a drop off in the sales, the realized sales of those the, uh, uh, produced, produced product in the third quarter compared to the second quarter, he thinks that means there will be some of that that will show up in inventory, which is why the inventory will stay higher than it might otherwise have been. Then you have a contribution of finished goods to inventory, preventing further inventory reductions. So he thinks uh, that, and that would be partially what we're just talking about. You've got, you might have uh, maybe last quarter you had, uh, you know, a hundred of those uh, uh, mega packs, maybe you had a hundred of them sitting around or <laughs> are, are on the way. They couldn't be uh, taken out of inventory yet, but maybe this quarter was 125. Well, if it was 25 more, that's $25 million. I mean, that, or, well, 25 million at sell. So uh, maybe that's uh, 25, maybe that's about 18 million at cost. So that, you know, that, that starts to make real difference. Then you've got inventory of vehicles estimated to decrease by 2,000 to 104,000 for 16 inventory days, which would be really good. That's a very solid number. You know, I might be able to get it down a little bit less than that, but that's a, as you can see, that is a very normal number uh, over the last four years uh, to be at 16 days. And then we finally, a couple of more slides here. We've got uh, CapEx spending significantly reduced to uh, from the very high, very high number in the first quarter, uh, a little bit lower in the second quarter, and now slightly up from the second quarter, but still lower. He thinks this number will be going up in the new year. And then the last 12 months investments remain near 10 billion. So looking backwards, the total investments around 10 million over a 12 month period. A lot of that would be, of course, in the AI infrastructure 
all those purchases of those uh, of those chips from NVIDIA and others, actually. Um, so he's saying this implies that Tesla did not meet its CapEx spending guidance, came in below. This was likely caused by shifting earmarked funds for the New Mexico factory for the, for the new sm small <laughs> lowercase n, the new Mexico facility to AI infrastructure spending. And so there are delays in getting that those uh, some of that that AI infrastructure and of course no expenditure in Mexico. He says free cash flow. Uh, the quarter over quarter reduction is driven by a lack of significant inventory unwind, as mentioned earlier. Tesla's financial resources are expected to be near thirty six billion. So we now might be increasing to thirty six billion of uh, of. Uh, available financial resources with 31.3 billion in the bank. He says, in addition, the company has a $5 billion unused credit facility. So you add that 5 billion to the 31.3. Now I think that credit facility is primarily to be, is primarily being used uh, for leases and or for loans uh, so that they can take the loans off of their books and, uh, and uh, sell them off to others. He says, increased depreciation is driving increased Cash flow positive depreciation unwind. It says Tesla's AI infrastructure spend is expected to increase to 2.9 billion in the third quarter after being 2.5 billion in the second quarter. That's the combination of property, plant, and equipment. If you want to look into the details of this, I'll take a second here. You can take a screenshot. And then uh, legacy automakers are reporting reported margins have been depreciation slash advantage over Tesla. As a result, at some margins, Tesla's underlying business is stronger when you compare it to others. So accumulated depreciation uh, for Tesla is greater than the others. He says Tesla continues to recognize less than two thirds of quarterly deferred revenue additions, which is driving an ever higher deferred revenue balance. So they now have three point almost eight billion dollars on the books. Um, <laughs> just a deferred revenue that's you know we already know will be coming in. And he says from the first from the one first quarter 2023, Tesla started to over deliver on their 12 month deferred revenue release guidance. So this is uh, starting to produce some posit positive news. He says, this suggests that Tesla started to outperform their one year prior guidance. An, increased, an increasing positive gap between the green and blue line signals greater than expected FSD revenue recognition. And this is a positive development. Deferred revenue releases up are 34% year to date while balance continues to accumulate on low recognitions a growing honeypot, he says. So bottom line, quarter over quarter EPS increase driven by lack of any one-time charges. Analysts will look through and look at the adjusted EPS. Significant decrease in auto margin will, slight, will, will create some slight uh, headline risk. Lack of inventory unwind drives sequential drop in free cash flow, creating further headline risks. So that's how the market is going to look at it. All right, so there you have it. Uh, if that was valuable to you at all, and you would like to show your appreciation, hit the like button, hit subscribe, hit notify. Later today, we will have the regular Tesla, you know, like whatever, what you know, something usually happens between Friday night and Saturday afternoon. So there's usually some news to report on and economic news as well. So on Saturday afternoon, we're like the only ones in the entire world who report news on Saturday for Tesla, I think. No, there might be others, but I haven't noticed. Not on a regular basis, at least, reporting just the general news. So that's what we do on Saturday afternoon. Um, tomorrow, what do we got coming tomorrow? Um, probably another conversation with you guys. I'll probably take a look at your comments again um, and, and respond to some of those comments. And then I got a couple of other things up my sleeve, which are maybe for Sunday. You know, sometimes during the football season, I only do two shows on Sunday because you guys, some of you at least, prefer football to watching my program. 
I don't, I just don't get that. How does that work? Exactly. <laughs> All right. And you know, there has been zero, not one, not one Patreon person signed up the last two weeks. Um, so this would be a very good time to say, okay, Randy, I give up. Maybe if you just stop talking about it, I'd do it. I don't know what I don't know what you're thinking out there, but you know, three bucks a month, five bucks a month would really be important to me. I don't know how important it is to you, but I'll let you make that that uh, decision, and hopefully you'll make it in my favor. <laughs> All right, it's been great talking to you.